As I record this in September 2024, NASA's target for launch of the Artemis II lunar flyby mission is one year from now, September 2025. In some ways, that's both a long way from now and also no time at all. There are caveats about the September 2025 date today, which I am covering on what seems like a weekly basis now. But now also seems like the time to begin taking a look at the Artemis II mission. In this video, I'll start with an early preview of Artemis II at a high level, but first go over the history of the mission, which goes back several years, when none of this was called Artemis. However it is named, for the life of this current incarnation of NASA's Beyond Earth Orbit plans, Artemis II has always been conceived as the first crewed mission to fly to the moon since Apollo 17 in December 1972. Let's take a deep dive into early lunar concepts for the mission, arrival on the core risk reduction concept for the mission, and how some of the details were rearranged around that. The concept for the Artemis II mission has existed for over a decade. When originally conceived, it still had the designation of Exploration Mission 2, or EM2. If we go back to 2012, after SLS and the multi-purpose crew vehicle version of Orion were established following termination of the Constellation program, the original plans called for two Orion SLS test flights. Exploration Mission 1 would be in 2017, which would be the first all-up SLS Block 1 launch. Then Exploration Mission 2 would be in 2021, which would be the first all-up Orion MPCV flight, the first crewed one. Again, due to the funding ceilings, major Orion development was spread out. That never changed and continues through what is now called Artemis II today. Since all the upper stage and upper stage engine development from Constellation was canceled, along with all the other launch vehicle development, both missions would be launched with the SLS Block 1 vehicle, which used the commercial off-the-shelf Delta IV upper stage from United Launch Alliance with the also off-the-shelf RL-10 engine from Aerojet Rocketdyne to save money. In that first year or so of the SLS program, the EM-1 profile was a straightforward free return lunar flyby mission. EM-2 would send the crew into a high lunar orbit that was reachable with the SLS Block 1 and the Orion MPCV and its European service module. As with SLS, development of an upgraded main engine and the Constellation service module for Orion was canceled, and MPCV is using leftover Space Shuttle Orbital Maneuvering System engines. Since EM-2, now Artemis-2, has always been the first crewed flight of Orion and SLS, the concept of a hybrid triple design reference mission was conceived as a lower risk plan. After EM-1 was changed to a distant retrograde orbit mission, NASA re-examined options for EM-2. These slides from a March 2016 presentation to the NASA Advisory Council Exploration Committee outline some of the options being considered, including the hybrid triple mission that was the eventual option selected. We've been talking about the Exploration Upper Stage and SLS Block 1B for a while, and in the middle of the last decade, EM-2 was going to be the first Block 1B launch, co-manifesting a conceptual version of the gateway power and propulsion element. Even before the mission was officially assigned to Block 1B in early 2016, this mission concept of a hybrid triple orbit was the plan, with SLS initially inserting Orion and its upper stage in low Earth orbit for one revolution, then the upper stage making an apogee raise burn into a high Earth orbit for one revolution. The ARB is like a partial translunar injection burn, providing a large fraction of the velocity for a translunar injection, which Orion would complete many hours later. That Orion TLI burn would fly by the moon, and at the end of that revolution, Orion would re-enter Earth's atmosphere, descend, and splash down to complete the mission. So that's three orbits one low Earth orbit, one high Earth orbit, and one orbit all the way out to the moon and back. This mission has long been planned as the first crewed Orion mission to essentially complete phase D of the program life cycle. The first LEO revolution would have a period of around 90 minutes, the second HEO revolution would be around 24 hours, 
and the third revolution that flies by the moon would be around eight days, four days out and four days back. In the back and forth with the SLS upper stages between the Block 1 interim cryogenic propulsion stage and the Block 1B EUS, the mission profile remained pretty much the same. The difference between the two was that EUS could also carry a 10 metric ton class payload like PPE and send that payload on a polar flyby of the moon at an altitude of 500 kilometers. For a period of time in the 2017-2018 period, EM2 with the extra performance from EUS and Block 1B would have performed what was called a multi-TLI free mission with the PPE flying as that co-manifested secondary payload. After the ARB Apogee raise burn, Orion would separate, leaving the PPE with EUS. EUS would then make a TLI burn with the PPE that would target a heliocentric disposal trajectory at that 500 kilometer altitude over the moon. The PPE would then separate from EUS and make a short trajectory adjust maneuver to retarget a flyby that stays within the Earth-Moon system and allows a spacecraft's solar electric propulsion system to transfer into the gateway's near rectilinear halo orbit over an approximately 76-day period. EUS also improves launch availability with the performance to send payloads from a circular parking orbit in LEO versus the high apogee, high eccentricity insertion orbit for ICPS. But as I've noted a few times, work was stopped on EUS in 2018. The PPE was moved to a commercial launch vehicle, eventually assigned to Falcon Heavy, and the early SLS launches were moved back to Block 1. The next year, 2019, those exploration missions were rebranded, with EM-2 rebranded as Artemis-2. That hybrid triple profile still remains, with the mission officially rebaselined near the end of 2018. The biggest change to the mission in the last five years or so is this proximity operations demonstration that was added in 2020. During the short tenure of Doug Lavero as the Associate Administrator of NASA's Exploration Directorate at the end of 2019 and for a few months in 2020, multiple risk reduction measures were applied to possible critical paths towards Artemis III, which had become the most urgent thing NASA was doing, with a requirement to land on the moon by the end of 2024. That was when the first two gateway elements were co-manifested to fly together, and that was also when NASA decided to add a ProxOps demo to Artemis II. In the 2021 timeframe, it was decided not to make any changes to the spacecraft hardware or software configuration, but rather to have the flight crew hand fly the demo, which also serves as a handling qualities evaluation of Orion's flight control system with the manual piloting inputs coming from the astronauts. It was also decided to use the ICPS as the target for the ProxOps and handling qualities demonstration. This occurs in the period right after Orion separates from ICPS in this high Earth orbit. So rather than firing the upper stages engine again within an hour of Orion separation to basically complete TLI and target a heliocentric disposal, instead the stage will make a shorter burn after the ProxOps demo, which will target an ocean disposal. So let's take a look at the sequence of events and maneuvers for that first day or so of this now heritage hybrid triple mission. We can compare and contrast differences between the late 2018 rebase line to ICPS and the subsequent incorporation of the ProxOps and Handling Qualities demo. The graphic that NASA put out shows things at a glance. But we can also go back to the 2018-2019 one when it was called EM2 and then Artemis 2. The SLS boosters and core stage insert Orion and ICPS into an elliptical orbit with a high apogee and suborbital perigee. ICPS makes a short perigee raise maneuver burn, which makes the perigee 185 kilometers or 100 nautical miles, while the mostly empty core stage and attached launch vehicle stage adapter make most of a revolution, going up to the 2200 kilometer apogee and then re-entering, breaking up, and being disintegrated in the upper atmosphere. Then ICPS makes an apogee raise burn to a high Earth orbit, Orion separates, 
and ICPS makes a disposal burn. Orion and crew perform environmental control and life support systems checkouts in the day-long high Earth orbit before the spacecraft makes the translunar injection burn to circumnavigate the moon on a free return trajectory. Aside from a few trajectory correction burns, there would not need to be any major maneuvers all the way out to the moon and all the way back. Now we can take a look at the newer but still preliminary numbers we got from NASA early last year in 2023. In this first slide, we're looking at the launch and insertion through main engine cutoff and then the initial ICPS burn to put the upper stage and Orion in low Earth orbit. The launch will target a higher energy insertion orbit than Artemis 1. Additional performance reserves were held for the first SLS launch, which targeted an orbit at MECO of 975 by 16 nautical miles, or about 1806 by 30 kilometers. For Artemis II, MECO targets a similar perigee, but the apogee is now 1200 nautical miles, or about 2222 kilometers. Orion and ICPS will separate from the core stage and launch vehicle stage adapter at that point, and both will coast up to the high apogee. This is one of the differences between the 2018 plan and the revision. At the time of the late 2018 revision, an option was selected which would have had ICPS perform a perigee raise maneuver only a few minutes after MECO, do that first, and then deploy Orion's solar arrays later in the orbit. That has since been revised to the timeline that we saw on Artemis 1, where the solar arrays are extended a few minutes after MECO, and the PRM burn occurs at the more optimal point in the orbit, at Apogee. We can see the resulting orbit after PRM. Like Artemis 1, ICPS will fire for less than 30 seconds to raise the perigee up to 100 nautical miles, or 185 kilometers. When the spacecraft and upper stage make it around to the 185 kilometer perigee, as on Artemis 1, the ICPS will make a long burn. Unlike on Artemis 1, it won't be quite as long because of this 24 hour ECLIS checkout risk reduction activity that has pretty much been the plan for this first Orion crewed test flight for a decade. The late 2018 baseline was targeting a 42 hour checkout orbit where the apogee would have been much higher over 59,000 nautical miles, which is about 110,000 kilometers. But that was before the ICPS was repurposed to be the target for proximity operations demonstrations. Now with more like a 24 hour long checkout orbit, the Apogee will be 40,000 nautical miles or about 74,000 kilometers. After the Apogee rays burn, Orion will separate from ICPS and that will start the demo. At separation, Orion leaves the Orion stage adapter and the spacecraft adapter cone attached to the SLS second stage. NASA is starting to release more graphics about the ProxOps demo. This one is from March. Similar to the transposition and docking maneuver during Apollo missions, Orion will separate out to station keeping distance from the ICPS OSA SA cone stack and turn around to face it. Through Orion's windows, the two astronauts in the pilot seats should be looking at this docking target on the OSA diaphragm. After performing a set of tests of Orion's handling qualities under manual control by the crew, they will then fly an approach to ICPS using the centerline target as a reference point. Typically, there will be rendezvous aids on a chaser spacecraft like Orion that the crew is using perhaps including a centerline camera in Orion's top hatchway. Another centerline target is installed on the ICPS on one of the X braces. This is a picture that ULA published last year after that was installed on ICPS 2. As the graphic depicts, after the first approach and handling tests in close proximity to the stage, the crew backs Orion away. The stage will then use its own attitude control system to maneuver to a solar normal attitude, which, as the graphic says, is better for the thermal control for the stage. After the stage maneuvers to solar normal, then the Orion crew will make a second manual approach to this other centerline target before a final separation from ICPS. 
At this point, four and a half hours or so after launch, Orion and ICPS will be opening up to a safe distance from each other, but are in this high Earth orbit with an approximately 24-hour period. The ICPS batteries won't last that long, so it will make a disposal burn to target its own re-entry, breakup, and destruction, like the core stage and LVSA, over the ocean away from population centers. One of the interesting bits of trivia is that the ARB targets a suborbital perigee at the surface, a perigee of zero. Just like the launch, everything placed in that orbit has to traverse most of that orbit. In the case of the first low Earth orbit, with a period of around 90 minutes, a little more than that, a burn was made at the high point to raise the perigee back up to an orbital altitude of 100 nautical miles, or 185 kilometers. The same thing happens for the second high Earth orbit with the day-long orbital period. The ICPS has made a disposal burn to lower its perigee to a negative number, but many hours later, around the time that Orion reaches the 74,000 kilometer apogee of the orbit, around 13 hours after liftoff, it will make the perigee raise burn to lift that up to 185 kilometers again. If there was a reason to abort the lunar flyby and come back to Earth, this PRB could be skipped and Orion could return about 24 hours after launch. If the PRB is executed as planned, which would be during the crew's first sleep period, then the Orion TLI burn would be conducted about 25 hours after launch, as the spacecraft reaches that 185 perigee again. The TLI burn would also target a suborbital perigee for when Orion returns to Earth more than a week later after flying by the moon. A series of small, optional trajectory correction maneuvers are scheduled along the way to fine-tune the trajectory and the timings of critical events for the remainder of the mission. When it was originally defined in the middle of the last decade, the lunar flyby was out at the Earth-Moon L2 libration point distance of around 33,000 nautical miles or 61,000 kilometers above the moon. That was adjusted to a closer distance of around 5,000 nautical miles, in part so that it occurs during the crew's workday. So that's a look back at some of the history of the mission profile design and an early preview of what the Artemis II timeline looks like with the updates provided in the last year. We'll be following any new details that might be provided about the different phases and segments of the mission as Artemis II gets closer to launch. Thanks for watching, as always. Click on the like button if you found this video informative. As I record this in September 2024, we're still waiting to hear decisions from NASA about the Artemis II schedule. But as they get closer to flying the mission, there should be more details about the mission to talk about.